Guys, it's all about confidence. Confidence knowing you'll be ready to go when your partner is and confidence knowing that you'll be able to go a few extra rounds when needed. And confidence is what you will get with the chewables from bluechew.com. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com promo code HOLLY, all one word, to receive your first month for free. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest today, I just want to thank all of my new Patreon members um, by name. In fact, I just want to acknowledge that you support the show and how much I appreciate it. So I want to welcome J. Richard Springfield, Felix, Alvin, Bill, Lance, Ryan, Martin, Nick, Michael, and Darren. Thank you guys so much. You are the reason that this show exists, that I was able to move into a new studio. So uh, I just want to thank you guys so much from the bottom of my heart. And of course, to all of my long standing Patreon members, um, you guys know who you are. I love you guys. You're awesome. Okay. So our guest today was facing an issue that sadly too many women deal with today. As a single mom, her job as a teacher was not bringing in enough income to support her family. Desperate to transition out of the poverty cycle, she decided to try OnlyFans. What happened next, you can probably guess. Her new side gig was discovered by her peers, and she was fired from her job. Today, she is here as a successful content creator to tell her story about her journey from being a struggling mom to an independent businesswoman whose mission it is to empower women through her own experience of embracing her sexuality and taking charge of her own life. Please welcome Sarah Jury. Hello. Hello. How are you? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. Yay. Good. I'm so glad. So I, you know, let's let's start with your story, of course, because that's where everything else comes from, right? Yes, of course. And uh, like you mentioned, I was a teacher for almost 20 years. And about five years ago, I became a single mom to twins. I have twins. And I was just struggling living in this poverty cycle. I worked a lot of side jobs like many teachers do. I did teeth whitening and sublimation, keto coaching, uh, group exercise, and reading tutoring. So I was constantly working some sort of side hustle to make ends meet. And um, about... Uh, Six months ago or last spring, there was a friend on Facebook who had started an OnlyFans and she had made like $10,000 that month. And, you know, as an entrepreneur, I was like, I could really get out of this poverty cycle. I could pay my car off and uh, credit card bills, maybe take my kids on a vacation. And so it sort of got my wheels turning about exploring this opportunity. Yeah. And so what happened next? So I started a page, and um, I was going to have the month of July off of work. So that was sort of my plan was, like, test the water, see if this works, see if I could make any money on it. Um, And so question before you get into, like, everything that happened, because, you know, a lot of the girls that I know who start OnlyFans pages already – are in porn, right? Yeah. So they already have like a social media following of people like who know yeah. what they do. So how did you get, because I would imagine that you probably didn't post your OnlyFans link on like your family Facebook page. So how did you get people like, because OnlyFans is no discoverability, which is really yes, annoying. It's very difficult. So how did you get people to even find you and join yeah, your page? So that's an interesting question. I'm going to back up for just a moment because this is going to sort of explain why I started posting publicly about my page. Gotcha. So on my very last day of uh, work, it was a Thursday. It was my last day of summer camps before I had my month off. We actually had a conversation in the office about sex work. And my coworker, who is also a teacher, had said that her husband had gone to North or South Carolina and they had a stripper there for a bachelor party. And the stripper got $600 just to show up to the party. 
And us as teachers, we were like, wow, that's a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's like a whole week's worth of pay income. And uh, so my coworker actually said that she was uh, thinking about starting an OnlyFans page. And then she joked that maybe she would have her husband do it because gay men love him. And then my boss said, you both should start OnlyFans pages and sell your panties on it. Men love panties and you could make a lot of money selling panties. Well, for me, that was permission to have my page and promote my page. You know, I never actually contemplated getting fired because my boss, who I report to, literally (laughs) encouraged me to start my page. And so I feel like that is a very important part of my story because um, that was when I started – I was on my summer break and I was like, I'm going to test it out for the month. So because I've been single for five years, I had lots and lots of men who had sent me friend requests over the years. So, I mean, I was thinking like a businesswoman and I just went and like accepted 600 (laughs) friend requests and men are pretty um, predictable. So as soon as I accepted the friend request, they would go straight to my DM and I'd hit them with my OnlyFans link. And then that was how I started promoting my page. So you weren't posting it on like the posting, the main part of Facebook where everyone could see it. You're DMing guys directly. I did that, but I also okay, gotcha. Put it in my stories, Mm -hmm. um, my OnlyFans handle, because like you said, there's no searchability, and I knew that if I didn't have fans, I wouldn't make any money. Yeah. So because I had the blessing of my boss, I was like, oh, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna promote it, and um, I was on my summer break. So, you know, it's kind of crazy that Facebook, which is, you know, one would consider like a family oriented and definitely not sex work friendly, like whatsoever yes. platform is how you were able to promote your only fans. Like, yes, it's that, also how I got fired. <laughs> right. Yeah. But my, I guess my point is, is that only fans really like should have some kind of discoverability yes. built into the platform so that, you know, you can promote yourself within their own network and not have to go to Facebook. Like, I just don't understand why they don't do that. To me, that's like you're missing out on a lot of, like, traffic and – And opportunity for people to just be able to pay for the the marketing, just like in Facebook where you can, like, um, uh, promote your business or something. You could pay for that. Um, And then I feel like because OnlyFans doesn't allow the searchability, it – forces models and content makers to try to create the pipelines through other social media. Right. And they're not friendly. No. <laughs> like they're I mean, always even, I'm always getting in trouble for stuff. One hundred percent. I mean we always have to fucking dance around yes. that whole thing, except for on Twitter and even that's changing now. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Elon Musk. <laughs> so very fucking much. <laughs> Anyways, go on. Yeah. So that was sort of what happened. I just started promoting my page page and um, a local right, extreme right wing blogger in my community um, who specifically targets teachers. He had caught wind or found out that I was a teacher with an OnlyFans page. He went to my OnlyFans page, purchased my nudes behind the paywall, use screenshotted the nudes, wrote a crazy article about me, distributed my news. So in the midst of all of this, I get revenge porned by him. Mm -hmm. And then he also sends the nudes to my employer. Um, So that was sort of the long and short of it. Like within four days of my boss encouraging me to start an OnlyFans and everything that transpired, I was fired. And it was interesting because my boss during the termination did not say anything. And that, to me, is the most infuriating part of the story because it's like, because you encouraged me to do this, I felt like my job was safe. And then you have the audacity to not say anything like, hey, I encourage this, not only me, but encourage my coworker as well. Um, So I feel like that's just such an important part of (laughs) what transpired because – That was literally why I felt like, oh, I can do this. Also, I wasn't um, a traditional teacher 
I was a field trip teacher. So mm-hmm. I was a contract employee for the state of Indiana. Mm-hmm. And um, I taught field trips. So teachers would come with their students for five visits and then go back to school. So mm-hmm. I didn't have the relationship with the kids that um, – You weren't, like, representing the school in a way that, like, a like a schoolroom teacher, I guess, would be – Yeah, where you would have these, like, close relationships. Mm-hmm. You would get to know the kid. For me, I was, like, the fun field trip teacher where yeah. they came and then – yeah. And, you know. Was your boss the one who actually had to fire you? His um, boss did. Okay. But he, I mean, he was there. He, he, he was there and he mm-hmm. just sat there and just said, said did you nothing. say anything to him about? No, because I was like so shocked and traumatized. And also you could imagine just the way um, his boss tried to shame me for everything. And I'm like, whoa, I didn't do anything illegal. Yeah. Um, and also now, like, I felt like I'm being like victimized again because this guy is like revenge porning me. He's writing all these crazy stories about me that aren't true. Um and so I feel like that's just so – and another interesting part of my story is that this blogger who revenge porned me, you know, at a certain point it wasn't about me posting nudes behind a paywall on a subscription site that a consenting adults are on. Mm-hmm. You know, the real issue is in the, this man using my nudes as another way to weaponize my body and my sexuality against me, you mm-hmm. know. Um I had never known about revenge porn. I had never heard about it, you know. Um, but then all of a sudden I, I'm in a victim in it. And I feel like that is even more reason for me to speak out about my story mm-hmm. because of this really unjust double standard between a man's sexuality and a woman's. Yeah. Can I ask how, like, when he fired you, what specifically did he say? Did he say that – Did he directly say that what you were doing was immoral or did he say that it was reflecting badly on the school? Like, how did he put it? Yeah, I think like in the termination paperwork, it said something about um, that I posted inappropriate photos, which is interesting because I have been on dating sites for five years and everybody's sharing nudes. Everyone's doing sexy chats. I have had, you know, hundreds of unsolicited dick pics sent to me as a woman on dating sites. And that's fine and okay and socially and culturally accepted. But the moment I do it as a woman for profit. As a thing. You're monetizing. Everybody lost their mind. Yeah. Because if you're doing it to find yourself a husband, which we all need to keep us under under control. Yeah, and I still need a husband. <laughs> <laughs> that would be different. But yeah, once you start monetizing it and profiting off of your own sexuality, yeah, that's it's a big cr- problem. It's crazy. And you know what's even crazier in the story is I was a civilian teacher in a military facility. And for years and years, I was sexually harassed there. Mm. I mean, it got so bad, I actually had to get a protective order against one of the soldiers in the building. Um And it's so interesting as a woman because I'm like, so if I'm sexualized at work and as long as I'm quiet and victimized by it, everyone's fine with it. Nobody has a problem with it. But the moment as a woman I own my sexuality and I monetize it, I'm not capable of teaching children anymore. Yeah. Um, I think that's really where I kind of dig my heels in and I'm like, whoa, we need to have some serious conversations around this because there really is this patriarchal system where women are not allowed to be sexual or sexy or express their sexuality in the same way that men do. Mm -hmm. Um, And even on OnlyFans, you know, where it's like men are making content on the platform, but you don't hear them getting fired, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like it's only the women still that are the targets of this. Yeah. That soldier that you had to get the protective order against, was he – Like, did he suffer any repercussions from that at all? No. In fact, even after I got the protective order, they still allowed him into the building. Um, They were just, I have a a whole file against them, you know. And even with my boss, as much as I got along with him, there were still these underlying sexual harassment issues. You know, even going back to him telling me to start my OnlyFans and selling my panties on it, you can see the themes of what I kind of dealt with as a woman in that um, 
position. And so that for me really is where I'm like, whoa, stop. We, I really have to talk about my story because my story is every woman's story in this mm-hmm. country and within this culture. And um, I think as I've gotten older and I've reclaimed my body, I've reclaimed my sexuality and I'm 41 years old, like I'm not the 20 year old woman that you're just going to gaslight and mm-hmm. you're going to manipulate with these stories about me. Like I have a voice and I'm going to tell my story and there's going to be people that need to be held accountable for the way I've been treated <laughs> throughout this experience. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, as a parent yourself, what would you say to the parents who might object to somebody who shoots anything, you know, pornographic on the side um, as being a teacher yeah, for their children. I, I think there's so many layers to my story and like so many beautiful conversations that can come up like this one. And, um, you know, I have like a couple thoughts about this. Like the first one is it's really important that teachers are humanized. This idea that that teachers, you can't go out and drink or kids might see you drinking. Well, teachers, you're adults. You're a consenting adults. And every teacher has a sex life at home in their bedroom, including me. I was actually celibate for a long time. And even when I joined OnlyFans, I was celibate. So that's the other interesting, ironic twist to my story was like, people would have been more okay okay with me bringing men around my children, sleeping, you know, participating in the hookup culture, having lots of sexual partners, um, but being celibate and finding a place to express my sexuality on the OnlyFans platform was wrong and horrible where it's like virtual sex is the safest sex I could have been having. Yeah. Um, So I feel like there is this um, need to really humanize teachers. They are humans just like everyone else. They're going to have private lives just like everybody else. And as long as that teacher is doing a good job in the classroom and being appropriate and kind and um, representing themselves well in front of your children, then what that teacher is doing outside of the classroom is not the parent's business, just like it's not my business as a teacher what those parents are doing in their bedrooms. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think there there is the standard for that. And I think, secondly, as a mother myself of two 11-year-old twins, this idea of porn really is the parent's responsibility to have these conversations around it, just like you're going to talk about alcohol, just like you're going to talk about smoking or drugs. The idea of sex and where porn fits in there for you and your family, I think um, instead of shaming the teacher, it's this beautiful learning uh, opportunity as a parent to talk about it because the truth is, the internet is the wild, wild west, and kids have access to things that you and I never did as uh, kids. And the responsibility to talk to your kids at ages younger than you think you're going to need the talks um, really needs to be brought to the surface, you know. And I think even for me, I've had to talk to my kids who just turned 11 and they knew way more than I thought they did. Um, But that was good for me because it gave me the opportunity to have these conversations with them and start them now um, so that they don't have to dismantle these ideas around shame and their body and sex that I have had to do. Mm -hmm. And also too, I mean, you know, sex education is sorely lacking in this country as I'm sure you as a teacher know. I mean, what is, is there sex, is there, there's not mandatory sex education in Indiana, is there? You know what's so interesting? It's only required in 13 states, I believe. Really? Yeah. And there is this political agenda that I got caught up in as a teacher where they call every teacher a groomer now and it's just like ridiculous. It's wild. And even if you are a proponent for sex education, in schools, and and I'm saying reasonably age appropriate yeah. about their bodies, starting at puberty, um, you know, just giving kids the language and the autonomy over their bodies. Um, 
there really is this backlash for this extreme right wing conservatives. And it's wild and it's really, really sad because these are the same people who are screaming about being pro-life. But it's like, in my opinion, if you're pro-life, then you're pro-sex, you're pro-condoms, you're pro-birth control, you're pro-sex education because you have to do everything that you can do to give people and, and kids and teenagers the autonomy to be safe and to, mm -hmm. to be empowered when they move into becoming a sexual being because they will. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's normal and it's healthy, you know, and I feel like it needs to be a partnership between parents and teachers to be able to set these children up so that we're not having these unwanted pregnancies or kids aren't feeling shamed or scared to go to their parents about be being sexually active. So I think that's what's making it even more difficult is that people aren't even willing to have these reasonable conversations about where sex ed fits in the schools. And in Indiana, they're trying to pass laws to ban books and, and arrest librarians and teachers. And it's, it's just really, um, almost like the twilight. Zone, yeah. Know? Yeah. It's really, it's really, it's actually scary how much fear is, um, there is around sex in this country yes. specifically and how that tends to breed like the opposite reaction that people want. They're like, yes. oh, if we tell our children that, you know, we don't talk about sex or we tell them like, you know, you need to be a virgin until you're married. Yes. And th like those are the kids that are more likely to go out and experiment with sex early and get pregnant because they have no education, no tools on protecting themselves. And no support where they feel yeah. like they can't go to their parents because right. it's this it's awkward and shameful thing. And I remember my daughter saying to me, like, Mom, this is this feels very awkward and uncomfortable that we're talking about it. And I said, That's okay. I just need you to know that at the right time in your life, I am the best, healthiest resource for you mm -hmm. um so that you can be empowered and protect yourself and um you know i think have this idea that you're going to turn into a sexual person and mm -hmm. that's okay mm -hmm. you know it's okay and it, it's normal and it's right and uh it's pleasure is okay and sex is okay and you know what beautiful gift can i give my, my kids and especially now being on only fans recognizing the importance of it so mm -hmm. that they can be healthy in their sexuality and their self sex mm -hmm. lives, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. All right, guys, we are going to take a quick commercial break and then we will be right back. So hang tight guys. It's all about confidence, confidence, knowing you'll be ready to go when your partner is and confidence, knowing that you'll be able to go a few extra rounds when needed. And confidence is what you will get with the chewables from bluechew.com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. And now they also have mint flavored chewables with the active ingredient in Levitra and Staxin, so you can stay hard and fresh. Blue Chew's tablets are performance enhancement for the bedroom and can help men gain extra confidence when it's time to perform. The process is simple. Sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. It's all online, so there's no awkward conversations at the doctor's office, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. It ships right to your door in a discreet package. If you want to take your bedroom game to the next level, you should try Blue Chew. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew for free when you use our promo code HOLLY at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com, promo code HOLLY, all one word, to receive your first month for free. Hey, guys, we are back. Okay, so, Sarah, what do you think is the biggest misconception about what you do? Um, You know, I feel like one of the things that people ask me a lot, I, people think that I get treated really poorly on OnlyFans. And I have- No, no, no. That's Instagram. <laughs> People will not pay to come on your page and bash you, but yes. when they can do it for free, like on Instagram or YouTube, 
or Facebook. I yeah. feel like Facebook is yeah. the worst. It's oh the free platforms. Then they're like, you're a whore. <laughs> oh, they love it. Yeah. They love it. Um, but no, like um, the OnlyFans platform, and this is something I like always advocate for because it's a virtual uh, sex platform. There is so many opportunities for healing around sexual trauma, sexual wounds, wounds with the opposite sex that I have found. Um, and I tell people all the time that my fans on OnlyFans are the most kind, the most considerate, the most consensual, the most respectful men that I've ever encountered in my life. It's been this beautiful, sacred safe container for me, especially as this drama and scandal was swirling around me to find these people who were just so supportive and so loyal and came from hearing my story in the media just to support me and and wish me well. Um, so I feel like that has been the most interesting and surprising thing is that I've never been treated better as a woman on the OnlyFans platform. It's yeah. been so healing for me. Isn't it funny when you like have to put your money where your mouth is, like how people are just so much kinder? Yes. Yeah. You know, um, we, we were talking a little bit before the podcast and you were talking about, you know, how you were 41 and how, yes. you know, what an interesting age to like start modeling nude and yeah. doing this stuff. And, and I have a very similar story. So I also have an OnlyFans page. It's very tame don't get excited guys <laughs> like blowjob videos sorry <laughs> um but i you know had been working in the adult industry for years and people were always like take your clothes off and i was like fuck you <laughs> and then i did but i waited until i was like in my 40s and yeah. you know and then i got pregnant almost uh, like pretty soon after and um, all through my pregnancy, I continue to do some modeling. And, you know, now afterwards, and my body has changed, as women's does when they get older and when they have children. And I have to say for myself, the the love and the support I've gotten through my subscribers on my OnlyFans page has been amazing. I mean, I feel more comfortable about my body now. I'm like 10 pounds heavier and just yes. a different shape than I was Same. before. Um, than I was when I was like skinnier and like, you know, like looked better, quote unquote. Yeah. And um, it's been, it's been really incredible. You know, we've been indoctrinated to believe that men only like women who are like, you know, 125 pounds, yes. have a flat stomach. Mm -hmm. And and certainly there are those men out there. But yeah. there are a lot of men that just love women of, you know, like all shapes and sizes. All and shapes and there's sizes. There's so many people out there that have different preferences. And you can always find, like, your little niche. You're and always going to have fans. Yeah. yeah it's, been, it's been really remarkable. Um, so for me, it's been, like, yeah, I mean, really helpful for my – self-image. Yeah, I agree. And I feel like the beauty to be able to like show up as a mature woman and be on this platform and help redefine beauty standards. Mm -hmm. Because if you believe you're beautiful and sexy, everything <laughs> can follow, you know. And I was saying before we started that most of my adult life, I was really, really overweight. And it wasn't until after my divorce that I really reclaimed my body. And it's just been so beautiful. And even now, like, tw if I'm 20 pounds up or 20 pounds down, I'm still going to be sexy. I'm still mm -hmm. going to show up. You know, I got cellulite. I got stretch marks. I have scars on my body. Still beautiful. You yeah. know, and I feel like those are also the lessons that are so healthy that just help a woman reclaim everything about herself. You know, it's like to reclaim your body, to reclaim your sexual energy, to show up exactly as you are mm -hmm. and to know that you are beautiful, that you fit. And here's a space on the internet where you can be a model and mm -hmm. you can show up in your beauty mm -hmm. and people will find you and like it. It's just, it's so empowering and I wish every woman could feel this for herself yeah and I think it's also great for the men too because you know there's also like we have these standards for men which are yes. you know unrealistic for most guys and and also you know men are subject to the same kind of like 
sexual shaming yes. or, um, you know, just these ridiculous standards, you know, penis size, like whatever the fuck yes. it is. And, you know, or even like you're not a man unless you're these things. I mean, there's a lot, you know, on this show we talk a lot about like women and the, and the stigmas that they face. But men, you know, face that too in their own way. And OnlyFans is a great place where, you know, a lot of women like yourself, I just had Alexis Fox on last episode and she was talking about this too, where, you know, you can really like, you know, men can come in and they can express themselves in a way that they don't feel like they can in real life yes. and they can be accepted and they can be encouraged and they can feel like safe about it. I yes. mean, like if there's one place that you can go to, to express yourself in a sexual way and not be shamed about it, like sex workers are those people, Yes, you know? Um, so it's like, it, it it's both sides, I think. It is. And I feel like a healing space for everybody. Yeah. If that is how your page is set up. And I feel like for me, because I am a teacher, you know, it's like I'm highly empathic. I'm very kind. I'm very caring. I am a safe space and a safe person for people's stories, for their hearts, for their traumas, because I've overcome so much of my own traumas. And so, like I mentioned earlier, it really is this beautiful platform that allows healing of all types. And I feel like what is so discouraging and disappointing is like people hear the word only fans and they get so triggered by it that they are missing out on hearing these stories about how good the platform is, how healing it can be, how helpful it can be, how empowering, loving and expressive it can be for people. And I feel like, you know, if people opened their minds and they opened their hearts to this paradigm shift, what transformation could this platform do for people's hearts and souls and healing around bodies and sexual traumas and even their traumas with the opposite gender? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like there, there's so much good and there's so much gold here. It's so funny what you say about like the word OnlyFans being triggering because <laughs> – when I post these clips on like various social media platforms, like Instagram, especially TikTok, I have to bleep out OnlyFans. And people are always like, why are you bleeping out the word? I'm like, I legit fucking TikTok has pulled down um, clips because yes. the word OnlyFans was said and there wasn't anything else sexual said about it. But people forget too, like OnlyFans is also home to like people who are – you know, doing cooking or yeah. fitness videos. It's not all porn. Most yeah. of it is, but it's not all but porn. But it is the gamut. Like you yeah. said, like my page is mostly nudes, some self-pleasure. Mm -hmm. I've, you know, dabbled a little bit into girl, girl and boy, girl content. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, for me, it's like my, fa my fans get to watch my journey in real time mm -hmm. as I open up sexually because um, when I started OnlyFans, I was celibate. I had been celibate for a long time uh, because I was so tired of the hookup culture and the dating sites. I was just done with it. You know, it's like mm -hmm. I'd rather just be by myself. Um, and so I think that's beautiful, too, is like I get healing for myself and mm -hmm. I get to explore things that I never would have because I would have never given myself permission to. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of remarkable. Yeah. Um, what do you think that we as an industry can do to fight the stigma that we face every day? Yeah. I think especially with the OnlyFans platform, the face of the sex worker is changing. Mm -hmm. And so it really is. It's the teacher. It's the mom next door. It's the pastor. And so I am hopeful that that's going to be helpful. And I think just having more and more open-hearted conversations about it, intellectual conversations about it, because when you can start having these conversations, it opens people's hearts, it opens their minds, they can start deconstructing and uh, dismantling these programs and dogmas that they've been indoctrinated with their whole lives around sex and their bodies and sexuality, mm -hmm. you know? And so for people who are like, well, she was a teacher, how dare she? Mm -hmm. How dare she, you know, be this sexual being? Well, honey, I'm going to be a sexual being. I'm mm -hmm. going to be a powerful being. You know, I, uh, when I had my divorce, 
and I lost everything in it. I had two mantras for myself and they were to become the most beautiful version of myself and to live my most beautiful life. And that's it. Anything outside of those two things, we're just going to uh, have to fall away. And, you know, for me, even living in poverty as a teacher, I, I reject that. You know, I unsubscribe to the idea that I have to live in poverty because I chose teaching, mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> and I know what teachers were paid. And so for me, it's it's like this idea that the whole world has opened up to me, mm-hmm. that I am now a magnet for abundance, that there's money in this industry that I never would have been able to touch as a teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, this is an opportunity to change my whole life that uh, two years ago, my daughter wrote on a dollar bill, millionaire mama. And, you know, so for some people, this looked so shocking, but really I feel like it was the universe working on my behalf to help me reach my goals and become this highest version of myself and where I can really receive my birthright of abundance and joy and pleasure and, you know, joy and sex and all of these beautiful, yummy things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know... (laughs) I, we've, I've had this conversation so many times, like with my husband and just various other people that it's just such a shame that teachers are paid so little because they've wanted like the most important jobs out there, which yes. is literally like you go. So my daughter just started uh preschool. Um, I mean, it's more like daycare at her age. She's almost two and a half, but it's like a preschool to pre-K yeah. anyways. And I was terrified to like drop off my child with a stranger all day, you know, like I just, not that I didn't trust the teacher or what, but I just didn't know them. And, you know, the idea, it's, it's scary when you have your own kid. Um, so, you know, this is such an incredibly important job and the fact that, you know, it's so undervalued, so underpaid. And I think about the teacher's that made a difference in a positive way in my life and how important they were and how I still remember them all these years later. And then the fucking batshit crazy (laughs) teachers that I fucking had, like specifically in high school. And I went to, you know, like a decent high school. I went to Calabasas High. It was like, you know, in like a wealthy community. Um, So you would think that you, I I don't know actually why you would think that you would attract decent teachers, but like, Dude, there like my photography teacher, like I first of all, I knew more about photography than she did when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah. Like I legit she and she knew that I knew that and she would just like let me do my own thing yeah. because like she didn't even teach us about the difference between the color balance of like tungsten lights versus daylight lights, which is like basic basic photography stuff. She knew nothing. Like it was in crazy how little yeah. she knew. Yeah. Um and, you know, she she taught she had been there for like 10 years and she was fucking nuts. And I'm sure she was drinking all day and she was so inappropriate and she would like snap at people for no reason. I mean, you were scared to talk to her, ask her questions. She yeah. was so nasty. Yeah. And then like sometimes she'd come in and she'd start telling about like us about her like relationship with her boyfriend, like in details that like we should not be hearing. Yeah. yeah. And then I think about my history teacher who threw me out of class for, for he called he told me I looked like a whore in front of my entire classroom. And let me tell you something, I fucking didn't look like a whore, okay? <laughs> I wore a dress that my mother bought me. And yes, we all know my mother's a pornographer and she's a little bit of a whore. But um, <laughs> she did not buy, it was a beautiful dress. Yeah. Like I, yeah. it was a white dress, it was short sleeved. It was like, you know, it was higher than this. It had buttons that went down um, and then it ended at the knee. Um, You could not see anything through it. It was like a beautiful dress. And I walked into class and he was like, you look like a whore. What are you wearing? And I was like, my mother bought it for me. (laughs) I was like, I didn't know what to say. And he was like, get out of here. Like, I, you can't be in this class in this dress. And I was hysterical. And I went and I sat down on a bench and I sobbed. My friend Mm -hmm. found me and she was like, we're going to the principal's office. This is bullshit. Like, there's nothing wrong with what you're wearing. And I went to the principal and he was like, yeah, there's nothing inappropriate in your outfit. And um, and I could tell by, like, the resigned look on his face that this – he had problems with this teacher. Yeah, he like was like, this, oh, I got to do Like this <laughs> fucking guy again, you know what I mean? Yeah. And he was, like, a problem for so many reasons. He was creepy. He played favorites. He was, yeah. like – anyways. But, yeah, and he – and it was just, like – 
I mean, these people, like, these are the kinds of people that should not be around children, not, yeah, yeah. like, sex workers. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's this idea that sex workers are, like, criminals, sexual immoral, deviants, yes. immoral. <laughs> they, like, you know, that there's no separation between their persona when they're acting out of fantasy behind the camera, like, you know, fucking mainstream actors do, and, yes. like, how they conduct themselves in their day-to-day life. Yeah, you know, and I feel like I really got the brunt of that. Like, people just automatically judged my morality, you know, mm-hmm. where it was like, listen, my morals are being a single mom and providing for myself and my kids, period. That's where my morals lie. And I will figure out – I will do anything to provide for my kids and myself. Um, but it's just so interesting because – People are okay with teachers being paid so little and having to work two or three jobs. Like, this is acceptable. This is just cult- culturally understood. Um, and I just I, I just disagree so profoundly. And I feel like the real travesty in this entire situation is that there are children who now will never know me as a teacher my joy, my passion, my compassion, my excitement. I mean, I was not just a teacher in that program. I was a favorite teacher. And teaching was my identity. It was my heart. And, you know, I really felt backed into a corner where I had to figure out a way to survive financially, you know. And, um, that was really why I started OnlyFans. It was it was for finances. And, you know, in the beginning when I was just selling nudes, it was like that was gas money to get me to work. That was groceries for my kids and myself. And uh, so I know that it's just so interesting that people just automatically judge my morals when it's like, no, I'm a very grounded, empathic, kind appropriate person. I'm thoughtful. Kids have always been very safe with me. They will always remain to be safe with me. I'm a mom and a teacher. Um, But yeah, I'm a sexual being too. And I don't apologize for it. I really don't. I feel like it's my prerogative to express myself sexually with consenting adults the way I feel like it's appropriate, you you know? And that's not anyone's business unless they choose to be on my OnlyFans page, Yeah, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, Do you think that we are moving towards a place of acceptance towards sex workers? Like, have you seen a shift or do you think that we're... I think it's interesting because even with my story, the way I was written about in the media... Um, I feel like they wrote about me in a way to really trigger people um, just because people have their own issues with sex and sexuality. So they project it Mm -hmm. onto other people. Um, So in one sense, you know, it's it's hard to say, but I will say that there was probably a very good 50 50 split on who supported me and who didn't. Mm -hmm. Um, I got as much support and people coming to my OnlyFans page and going out of their way, even parents of children that I taught oh, wow. came out. And uh, one I ran into at a park event I had taken my kids to right when it had first happened. And she told me, she was like, I am so sorry what you've been put through. She said- It must have meant a lot to you. It did. It made me cry. And she was like, my daughter, who I had just had a couple weeks ago in her summer camp, she said, my daughter adored you. And she said, that's all I need to know about you. Yeah. You know? And so I feel like there's going to be a shift. I feel like there's going to be a bigger shift as the time- of OnlyFans being around and younger people joining, I feel like it's going to be normalized. It's not yet, but that's why I feel like these conversations are so important because it's trailblazing. For as many women who have trailblazed the path for us to even be having these conversations, Mm -hmm. we get to be those trailblazers for those other women um, 
so that they don't feel shamed in their bodies and sexuality and, yeah. and have to do all that, you know, deprogramming that we had to do. Yeah. It's interesting what you said about the media thing too, because we both know that the two things that sell the best are sex and fear. Yes. And if you can wrap those two things up into one headline, yeah. chef's kiss. Oh, oh you're going to sell so much clickbait. <laughs> yes, it is so funny because when I got on the OnlyFans, I was like, I'm going to be in the MILF category, you yeah. know? And then all of a sudden when the teacher thing hit, I found out how many men have teacher fantasies. And I was like, of course, I was like, okay. cause it's like that authoritative figure. Yes. That's like, you know, obviously not related to you. And yes. And yeah. all of like the suppressed feelings of like, especially if they had a teacher and mm -hmm. teachers were off limits. And I'm like, I will be your sexy teacher. Please come yeah. to me. <laughs> Let me be your sexy teacher on OnlyFans. I actually created um, a dick rating report card, and that's, like, special to my page. And it, I, like, have a little template mocked up, and I love it. It's fun. So, you know, at a certain point, I just had to embrace it all, and I was like, okay, Sarah, like, you can choose how you respond to this, like – um, you can be like terrified and humiliated, which is exactly where people wanted to put me. This whole like cancel culture, which is, um, you know, I even have women reaching out to me. Some are teachers and they're like, I have wanted to come out. I wanted to try OnlyFans, but I saw your story and I'm so afraid of that happening mm -hmm. to me. And so I see why they do that. Like I just happen to be the person that was an example for every other woman where it's like, see, if you do this, what we will ruin you, we will destroy you, we will humiliate you. But I'm here to say that <laughs> it did not work. You know, I'm just um, blessed and unstoppable and I'm too resilient for that. And so it's my privilege to be an example and a role model for women and other women to say you can live in full expression and you can live your your sexiest hottest life with unapologetically even you know now I I saw your appearance on Dr. Phil yeah and you said that you're making seven times the amount now on OnlyFans than you were as a teacher yes. that might have even jumped since you're on Dr. Yeah. Phil because I know you like months have passed by and you've done mm -hmm. a lot of media. Um, even though you're obviously making enough money now to not be working as a teacher, yeah. if you had the opportunity, would you still be teaching? Yeah. Originally, my goal was to stay a teacher. <laughs> like, I wanted my teacher pay to be my side hustle money. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I was- That would be like your passion project. Yes. It was like, it was never the intention to like, just jump into this and leave teaching. But it was like, how can I fund myself in a way that I can support my kids and myself, but still do, but still be a teacher because mm -hmm. I love it because this is my calling and because- um, you know, my heart and my energy and my encouragement is exactly what kids needed in my classroom. And I mm -hmm. was very intentional with making my classroom positive in the same way that I'm intentional making my OnlyFans platform. Mm -hmm. All of my platforms are like all about positivity, mindset, manifesting, um, moving yourself out of victim mindset. Um, you know, I believe it for myself. I speak it. It's like, um, you know, claiming this new and beautiful life for myself. So I really just sort of had to reframe the experience that this blogger was the catalyst to take me out of a small classroom into a big classroom, that mm. there's other people, there's other hearts and souls and minds who need my story and my heart and my encouragement and to show them that you can keep going, you mm -hmm. know, that your, your life uh, story is not over yet. And you have the power to write your happy ending for yourself. Yeah, I love that. Do your kids know that you have an OnlyFans page? Yeah, they do. So originally when it first happened, um, so I taught fifth graders and my kids were going into fifth grade. And so I had to tell them like, that I got fired and that they weren't going to be able to have mommy as their field trip teacher because I had been working with their principal to bring my kids there. So originally when it first came out, I told them I was an Instagram model and, you know, that that just sort of quelled their questions, which was fine. 
But then, of course, because this became such a big deal in our lives, they they did find out that I'm an OnlyFans model. Um, and, you know, that's something that I do try as a mom to really separate the two lives. You know, when my kids are with me, I have, you know, 50-50 custody. So it's like when my kids are with me, I am mom. Mm-hmm. You know, when they're not with me, that's when I'm on OnlyFans and making content and having fun and exploring things. And there for me is like a very definitive separation between the two. But it is interesting because I live in a very small town in Indiana. I imagine pretty much everybody knows, probably everyone at their school knows. So I do try to be like very sensitive to it. But I also show my kids like, I am not walking around with my head down ashamed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to walk into the school and I'm going to have my head up. And, um, you know, because I don't I don't want them to ever think that if they ever get bullied the same way that I did, that they have to just hide away and. be be ashamed or be fearful or be afraid. It's like, no, we're we're walking out, our heads are up, and your mom gets to be on podcasts and I get to be a voice right now for mm-hmm. for myself and other women. And it's beautiful. You know? Yeah. How how did your ex-husband react? Have you had issues with him around it? Um, you know, he wasn't paying me child support. So I guess from my stance, it was sort of like, listen, I told you a year ago I needed child support. You put me off. You didn't do anything. So at this point, I'm like, as a single mom, I'm going to do what I need to do to provide for my kids. So it was like you also sat here and watched me for five years struggle as a single mom. Yeah. So I, again, I feel like I don't owe him anything because as the mother of your children, you weren't helping me, uh, support me and helping me provide. And you know, I was on a teacher salary. Yeah. So, um, he really hasn't said too much, but what he has said has been supportive. So I do appreciate that. I mean, I asked that question because, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had models reach out to me who I've shot and asked me to take their content down because they're in a custody battle oh. with their ex. Yeah. And he's using the As collateral. Yeah, the porn content that they shot, like even before the kids were ever born, to prove that like she's an unfit mother. <laughs> and like that just breaks my heart. Yeah, it really does. And it really goes back to that double standard between mm-hmm. men and women and also the ways that people will – um, try to use anything to dis- discredit a woman, to shame her, mm-hmm. to shame her sexuality, to s- shame her body. And it's so interesting, especially for men who created the field of sex work and they're the consumers of it. Um, and so where these lines get drawn in people's head as when it's okay, when it's not, when I'm going to use it against this woman for my benefit, um, those really are the initiatives that I want to stand up for, especially like revenge porn or using it in these defamatory ways because um, what a person does or their their sexuality or their sex work is not indicative of their morality or their ability to parent or their ability to be a teacher. Like those are two separate things. You know, they're yeah. like you said, there are probably teachers who are teaching who should not be, Yeah, <laughs> you know? Um, but people just sort of made me the scapegoat. I think for this like political agenda. You know? Yeah, for sure. And also like, I mean, you know, OnlyFans has changed the lives of so many people and has made it, you know, so much easier for women to take their sexuality and to monetize it and to yes. now make like so much more money independently, independent of shooting ever for any brands yes. or anything like that. And that was, that never existed before. Never and it's existed. created a whole new market that I think is like, is really like confused a lot of people. Because it's the first time that women are able to be their own bosses and own their sexuality and 
own their finances in that way. Yeah, and because that way it's revolutionary for women. Yeah, and it's very difficult to argue that like it's very difficult for someone to say to you like, "Oh, you're being exploited." Yeah. You know, like and your I'm suitcase pimp who's like making you do this and you're like, yeah. "What do you mean?" Like there's literally like it's me myself and yeah. I. And like I, there's nobody else. And I decide. And yeah. that's what's blowing people's minds. Cuz it's so much easier to place women in the role of victims yes. and say they're only doing this because they've been influenced by a pushy boyfriend, they have a bad agent, or, you know, they're being forced to shoot these scenes by this, like, sleazy director behind the scenes. He's got, like, you know, the porn mustache and, like, the fucking gold chain and, you know, the the chest hair and all this shit, so. Yeah, and how can a woman woman just be fully expressed in her body and her sexuality and want to explore these things and be okay with it and live freely like this? Um, That's really... Really, I think what's scaring people Mm -hmm. is that the power has shifted to the women and they do not like that. You know, and I always say OnlyFans is revolutionary. It's the only platform that allows women to empower themselves this way. And even going back to your conversation about the creepy teacher and and your dress, the truth is women are going to be sexualized no matter what. Yeah. You're going to be sexualized. And so if you can monetize it and you can profit off of it and do it so in a way that my college degree couldn't do for me, mm-hmm. it's all, it's a no-brainer. It's like all of a sudden I have all the power and mm-hmm. it's beautiful. It's so exciting. It's so exciting for people to like see this and to be a part of it, honestly. What do you say to people who suggest that porn degrades women? You know, I think it depends on the circumstances. You know, is the woman expressed? Is she making the decisions? Is she the one in the power and the control? If the answer is yes, then no, it's not. And that's really where that pendulum has shifted, where the woman now becomes the decision maker and the business owner, and the money's coming straight to her for her content. And so in that sense, you know, that's it's not true anymore. And I remember even being on the Dr. Phil show, They tried to make the argument, you know, one of the guests that she was in the porn industry and she was on drugs or this and that. And I said, yeah, but this is not the same experience. And so you're talking about an outdated experience that might have caused you trauma. And I, my heart hurts for you for that. But you also have to see that there's like three beautiful, intelligent women who were former teachers standing on the stage telling you that's not the case, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, we're not addicted to drugs. Like we're, we're grounded. We're self-actualized. We're educated. We're mothers, Mm -hmm. we're neighbors, you know? And so that argument doesn't stand anymore because now there's evidence to the contrary. Yeah. How was it being on the Dr. Phil show? I mean, that must've been intimidating because it's obviously got a huge reach. Yes. And, you know, I look at someone like Dr. Phil and I think like, like, oh, this is like the kind of show that has that agenda that's going to try to skew you yes. in a negative way. Were any of those thoughts occurring to you when you came on? And what was the actual experience like? You know, I have to say his producers, like everyone that worked for him, were so nice. Like I'm actually friends with one of the oh, producers great. now. Yeah, like just super nice, super sweet. Um, she was actually saying that um, – the, the guests that she had on were all OnlyFans models were like the kindest, the most responsive, the most responsible with getting things back. Well, because you're entrepreneurs. Yeah, we're business You're small women. business owners. And also we are all teachers. Like you have to tra- – <laughs> we're like organizing. <laughs> totally. You know, Like here's so- my curriculum of like shows that I'm doing this month, everybody. <laughs> exactly. So in one way it did feel exciting that he even – was open to this opportunity to allow us to come on and to speak our truth. Mm -hmm. In the other way, it was like a little disappointing just even the way the title was slanted, like from saints to sex workers, when really it should be like from saints to saints, like Mm -hmm. (laughs) sex worker does, you know, I feel like even in the language there, you're implying something that's not true. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, especially about me, I feel like there was a lot of my story that was cut out that I wasn't able to share while I was there, which was disappointing. 
And, you know, I feel like it's interesting. We were talking earlier about the scale and where people place things as this is okay and this isn't. And here you've crossed a line. Dating sites are okay and Tinder is okay. But me being on OnlyFans because I monetize all of those same behaviors was wrong and deviant. Um, and it occurred to me where I was like, Dr. Phil was on there. You know, he's, um, you know, being Dr. Phil. And he said, uh, oh, one of the things that I was thinking was like, his daughter-in-law was in Playboy. What's yeah. the difference? But you yeah. still see her as like the the beautiful mother of your grandchildren and smart and entrepreneurial and all of these like positive characteristics. Mm -hmm. But we're sitting here and, you know, not getting the same type of re representation. So that was interesting to mm -hmm. me. It was also interesting, too. I noticed that, like, they never said the word OnlyFans. No. It was always like, uh, online content. Yes. You got fired for posting content online. Like, what the fuck does that mean? And, like, just the the further into the interview it got, I was like, everyone who's watching this knows yes. what you're talking about. Did they tell you specifically why they wouldn't mention the word? Yeah, I think it was more of a legal thing um, because they have a ton of lawyers I'm for sure. them. And so even with my story about my boss telling me to start an OnlyFans and sell my panties on it, they kept trying, like, until we walked out on the stage, the producers were trying to contact my employer for a statement. And they would not. And so they took that entire part out. And I was devastated because I was like, this is part of my story. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it gives people clarification as to why I did it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, when your boss gives you permission and he also knew, you know, I was a single mom. I was struggling. I was working all of these different side jobs. It wasn't a secret mm -hmm. that I was struggling financially. Um, and so here he is. He's giving me permission to go and do this on my private time, at home, off the clock, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, I feel like that really is an important part of my story that I didn't get to share because they cut it out. But, uh, you know, I think it was mostly like legalities. Yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give to other mothers or women out there stuck in the poverty cycle who might be considering a jump to OnlyFans? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's not as easy as it looks, you know, um, and also um, we're still in the messy gray area where women are being um, still attacked for being on the platform. So I think that's something, you know, I didn't think about, I didn't realize, but it is um, – it is a reality that you could lose your job, that someone, that your ex could try to use it against you. Um, so there are still a lot of hurdles. There is still like a liability for joining the platform. But I will say, being on the other side of it, there's so much good. Mm -hmm. There's also so much good. And in our life, everything is a risk, right? Yeah. Me staying in that poverty cycle in the, as a teacher was as much of a risk as it was joining the OnlyFans platform, mm -hmm. you know? So it's sort of like you got, you got to pick your risk and go with it. Um, and also know that you have to be okay with whatever fallout or consequences come of it. Like some people's families won't talk to them after joining the platform. So there are some real things to consider, but if that's what you want to do and you want to explore it, then I say you should have the permission to do it. You know, there's things in healing on that platform that you won't get anywhere else. And Overall, the platform has a lot of good things and a lot of beautiful opportunities in it. So. Yeah. I will also say that I think people need to be comfortable with their own sexuality in some way, yes. right? Like, I think that's important. And I think also it's important for people to – because, you know, so many of these stories come out like – I joined OnlyFans and I'm making like seven times what I made as a teacher, yeah. which is this case for a lot of people, but not everybody does. Yes. Some people get on OnlyFans and they don't really make that much money. They don't have, um, you know, again, like the lack of discoverability is <laughs> yes. like atrocious on there. Oh, so, it's so hard. if you don't have some kind of social media platform, something, 
to get your name out there, there is a possibility that you won't really make a lot of money. So, so I think true. people need to recognize that it's a risk for all of the things that you just said. Yes. And there may not really be a reward. So to like really, you know, think yeah, about it. Think about it and and then make your decision. And I think for me, when I said like I had a friend on Facebook who start started an OnlyFans and she made ten thousand dollars that month, what she also failed to divulge was that she had thirty eight thousand followers on her Instagram. Yeah. And I had 300, yeah, you know? Yeah. So that's the other thing is like, I like to be very transparent, very honest about things like that because, um, you know, it would break my heart if somebody got into the situation like me and they didn't get the media cycle that I did and it didn't pay off in mm -hmm. the big way. Um, you know, in that case, you would feel like you've lost everything mm -hmm. and I would never want someone to feel like that. So my hope is that as time goes by, we're able to have these conversations only fans becomes more and more acceptable and the face of the sex worker changes as well which yeah. is it's going to it's happening like even in my life going into school I'm a mom I'm the former teacher I'm the neighbor next door and I'm a sex worker yeah. you know yeah <laughs> I'm yeah. all of those things and as a woman you can be yeah I love that. Well, I love your message, Sarah. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a pleasure. You speak really eloquently about a lot of really important issues. And so I appreciate you being here to, to you know, spread the word. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for paving the way and having this platform and, and giving this uh, industry a new voice. Um, because I feel like it's just it's going to change so many people's hearts and lives. Yeah. Thank you. Can you tell uh, everyone where they can find you online? Maybe where they can find your OnlyFans. <laughs> yes, I would love it. You can find me on, on all of my socials at Sarah Jury, Sarah with an H, J-U-R-E-E. -E, and my OnlyFans page is love underscore Miss Sarah uh, underscore VIP. Uh, so Miss Sarah, the teacher, I'll be your, your favorite OnlyFans teacher if you'd like me to. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And then you guys can find me at Holly Randall and on Instagram. And I never plug my OnlyFans page, but if you want to check it out, it's OnlyFans.com slash Holly Randall. And of course, if you want to support this podcast, go to Patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filtered. If I just threw a bunch of links at you that you're not going to remember, just go to hollylinks.com and you'll find everything there. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I will see you next week.